Paul talking about that having faith in Christ and His righteousness, not His own. He talked about how if we stood before the Lord based on our works, our deeds, our righteousness, you might have four or five things that you could put on the list that weren't too bad. You know, but it's certainly nothing to go bragging before the Lord about. But yet we stand before Him clothed in Christ's righteousness. And those are the things that are important. We have faith in Him. Verse 10, he says, That I may know the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death. Paul's talking about knowing, understanding, seeing the power of His resurrection. A resurrection's an interesting thing, isn't it? We think about that. We think about resurrection. We look at Christ, how He was resurrected on the third day. Rose from the dead. Came out of the grave. We had to compare that to different things in the Bible. There are others that were revived or had life restored to them. The other night on Wednesday night, we talked about Elijah and the widow's son. And he had life restored to him. One of my favorites is the kid that fell out of the window when Paul was preaching. Paul went down there and, and brought him back, had life restored to him. We all know the, the story of Lazarus, who was in the, in the grave for three days. The Lord said, well, hey, let's go get him out of there. And his sister said, he's stinking by now. Well, let's get him out anyhow, you know. And he had life restored to him. And then another of my favorites is when Jesus died on the cross there and everything rumbled, there were some of the old saints that had life restored to them and later came out of the graves. That would have been fun, wouldn't it? Think about that. Here you are walking up to somebody, hey, Bob, how's it going? <gasps> but that wasn't resurrection. That was having life restored to that same old body. To that same old corrupt mortal body. Jesus was resurrected. We see how, I mean, obviously, he was God in the flesh, could do what he wanted to, but how he showed up, just appeared in the room, in the upper room with the disciples and all that. There's some different things there. We think about resurrection, we all look forward to the time when we're raptured. You know, the dead in Christ go for, first, and, and, you know, depending on how long the Lord waits around for that, those that are still alive get to meet them in the air, and in the twinkling of an eye, we're transformed into this new life. That resurrection, there's a lot of power in that. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's read a little bit about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35, talking about this resurrection. He says, some will say, and how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what is sown is not made alive unless it dies. And what is sown, you do not, <clears throat> and what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be but a mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as He pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. 
There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as it is, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. All that to say that we're going to be resurrected into a heavenly, incorruptible, immortal body. Not at all like we have now. I like that imagery there of this just kind of being a seed. That seed's put in the ground and it dies and what comes up is very different from that. You know, how many of you have ever seen a peach seed? They're gnarly looking little rough things and all that. I mean, it's a good thing that what comes up after that is a lot different than that peach seed, isn't it? You know, we hate to get just more of them. Those people that we talked about, Lazarus and them, who had life restored to them, they came back to the same mortal, corrupt bodies that they had before. Lazarus probably needed cleaned up after that, you know? But it was that same deal. Resurrection is that new body that we have to look forward to. We're not really clear what it's going to be and all that. We have a few ideas and everything. It's better than what we got going on now. Praise God for that, right? That there's power in that resurrection, isn't there? We see the resurrection, the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead showed that His sacrifice was acceptable to God on our behalf. That it was an acceptable sacrifice. The power of resurrection is that there's life. That's where we have that assurance of that everlasting life. Not just continuing on in these broken down old bodies, but that everlasting, that spiritual life that we look so forward to, isn't it? Isn't this the thing that gives us the hope, the joy, the peace? Isn't this one of the things that change our life? That power of the resurrection? That joy that we have to look forward to this. It gets better. Yeah, it always, it's always getting better as we go. There's power in that resurrection. There's life. Not just physical life, but that spiritual life. And it's something that we look forward to. It moves us. It stirs us in this life. It gives us peace. Paul talks about, on it, as you go on in, in 1 Corinthians there, it talks about that, 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 that dying and everything and the resurrection and how we see in that the victory over death. Death is that one thing that, that, that is always there, isn't it? It's always kind of in the back of your mind. It's one of those things that we all know that it can happen to us at any moment. We don't like to admit that. Yet it's always there. Always one of those things. And for those that don't know Christ, that don't understand the power of the resurrection, that don't have the hope in that resurrection, it can be a terrifying thing. It's interesting, it's been quite a while, and I don't remember who, who put it out there. But reading about these near-death experiences, and you can take them for whatever you want. Right? And there, there's people that have some sort of glorious experience and everything, and they, they come out of it with some peace and everything, and that's fine. But what you don't usually hear, what's not real popular, what doesn't sell a whole lot of books, is those that do research on this find out that there are as many, if not more, people who have had that same condition that have had terrifying experiences of what they could only describe as hell. And that ter those terrifying experiences often do more to change the lives than the other ones. <laughs> but there's that reality 
that we all face of heaven or hell. You're going to go to one or the other. And it's that resurrection that we have in Christ that assures us that we're going to go be with Him, go to be in heaven with Him. That gives us that point, peace, you know. I often talk about dying, and it's like, I'm not afraid to die. I just really don't want to be there when it happens because it sounds like it's going to hurt, you know. Unless you get to go to sleep and just, you know, do that whole thing. That would be great. I'm good with that one. That would be cool. Anything else just seems kind of, you know, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't like to hurt, you know. Death has no sting. There's no fear other than the pain part of it. There's no fear in dying. It doesn't bother me to think about dying. You get sick and everything. I had a little flu thing going on here a while back. Somebody asked me, well, are you going to be okay? No, I'm going to live. (laughs) Which means we have to put up with more of this deteriorating physical condition that we're all in. You're going to be okay? Yeah, because I'm going to get out of this and go be with Jesus. That's good. There's power in that resurrection, isn't it? Doesn't it set us at peace in knowing that when that time comes, whether it be this body stops and we go be with Jesus absent from the body, present with the Lord, there's power in that. There's peace in that. There's joy in that in this life and facing whatever. You know, and we all look forward to the rapture. I think it's great to know and understand that there's nothing that needs to happen prophetically in the Scripture and everything for us to be raptured. It could be that trumpet could blow at any moment. You know? There's power in that. Power that changes the way we live our life, isn't there? And that knowledge of our resurrection, the certainty of that because of Christ and who He is and what He's done, Paul says, I want, to, I want to understand that. I want to see that. There's power in it because it shows the power of God over life and death. There's reassurance for us to know that our lives are securely in His hands, aren't, isn't there? It's easier for us to, to have that, that assurance and reassurance that we get from that for our own lives. Sometimes easier than it is for others. But those people that we care about, that we know that we love, they're in His hands too. Especially those that we know that love the Lord. And there's peace in that. It's great when we have a, a memorial service, a funeral service for somebody that we, that we know love the Lord. We saw the fruit of the Spirit in their lives and there's just no doubt. And we're like, alright man. There's even... Uh, for me, anyhow, and maybe not with you, but to, for me, there's a little bit of jealousy there. It's like, <laughs> I want to go too. <laughs> but it changes the way that we live our lives. Seeing that that power of God at work in our lives and the certainty of that resurrection, Paul wants to understand that. He says that I may know the power of His resurrection. The power of God in our lives. The power of God with our lives. He says, which is, where did I go? Verse 10, he says, In the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. Paul says he wants to know the fellowship of His sufferings. He's willing to suffer for the Lord if that's what it takes. We don't suffer a whole lot for the Lord these days in our country, in our culture. We don't suffer very much at all. Yeah, there's, we have to deal with some of the things that they say about us as Christians and the, how the you know, people that come against the things that we know to be true. There are those that call us haters because we stand for the Word of God and what He says is right. And yet we just speak the truth in love. But there's not a whole lot of suffering. Some look at this and say that Paul even had a desire to suffer for the Lord. And in those places and in those times, even now when there's severe physical persecution with Christians, there's been a, a, 
a desire for some to have their faith tested or proved, not tested so much, but proved in that way. I'll go and stand. I'll go and, and be martyred for the Lord. Most people would look at this these days with our, our psychology and say, well, he's got a martyr complex. You know, I'd rather live for the, for the Lord than be you know, persecuted and martyred and tortured and all that stuff. But if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. Because knowing Him, the fellowship with Him, the power of His resurrection and everything is more valuable and means more and has more effect on my life than the fear of doing that. Paul says, even suffering, I'll go, I'll do the suffering. Even unto death, Paul willing to just lay his life down for the Lord as he'd already proven many times. And sometimes we think that maybe it'd be a lot easier for us to, to, to lose our lives for the Lord than it is to live our lives for the Lord. There again, we come back to that that resurrection, absent from the body, present with the Lord, just get it over with as quick as you can. You know, willing to die for the Lord because we know what's in store. Sometimes it's more difficult to live for the Lord than it is to die for the Lord. And yet we do that too. Paul says he'd be conformed to his death. He says, if by any means I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead... Now, he's not talking about earning this resurrection. It's already there. It's given to us in Christ, the certainty of that. He says, but I'll deal with this. I want to know the power of his resurrection, even to the fellowship of the, of, of the suffering as Christ did, even to death. Whatever it takes to get there. Whatever comes my way in this life, I will gladly suffer unto death for Christ because of the power of the resurrection and the, the, the um, excellence of the, of the knowledge of that relationship with Christ. Because it's so important to him, so valuable. He's talking about that witness that he has in this life. So that he may arrive at that, at that time of resurrection having that witness of being willing. And he did suffer for Christ even unto death, as so many Christians, as so many believers have done before us and do now and no doubt will after us, should the Lord tarry. Jesus said for those who find their lives will lose it. We hold on to it if this life in the flesh is so important, more important, then we'll lose that life that we had in Christ or that was there for us in Christ. But if you're willing to lose this, to put it all down, to count it as rubbish, to suffer, to die for Christ, and that you'll see the power of His resurrection. Verse 12, he says, Not that I have already obtained or am already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if any think and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul says he's willing to, to suffer and be conformed to the death of Christ to obtain the resurrection. He says, not that he's already attained it, I'm all, not, or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has already laid hold of me. There's more to come, isn't there? We have this, we're, we're born again. We're born again believers. When we come and we accept Christ, ask Him to forgive our sins, 
ask Him to be Lord of our lives, the Holy Spirit moves in. And we're born again, new creatures in Christ. But just like anyone that, that, that's newborn, you start out as a baby. How many of you remember being a baby in Christ? How many of you have been a baby in Christ for 20 years now? <laughs> you know, as little babies are cute when they do little baby things, but when they're you know, 20, 30 years old, it ain't so cute anymore. But we grow in Christ. Paul saying, I'm not there. I, I haven't got this perfected. I'm not perfected in the Lord yet. But I'm working towards that. I'm growing in the Lord. It's not us that, that and our hard work and everything that grows us in the Lord. It's the work of the Lord. But we long for that. We desire to grow and to mature in Christ. Don't you? Don't we? Hopefully we do. It's always amazed me gratefully to see that the Lord loves us enough not to leave us the way that we are. That way, I was real grateful with that when I first got saved and even as I grow in the Lord, I'm still grateful for that. The Lord's not going to leave us as we are. We will learn and grow and become more mature and have spiritual wisdom as we walk with the Lord. We've given things to pass on. Paul says, I'm not already a obtained it. I'm not already perfect or complete. He's still got some growing to do. And so do we. we still got some growing to do in the Lord. You know, I, I look back to when I was first saved in my relationship with Him and yeah, it was, it was, I was a child in the Lord. And there's been a little bit of growth. You know, maybe, maybe one year for every three that I've been saved. But you know, there, there's been some growth in the Lord. There's been changing. Paul says, I'm not already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ has also laid a hold of me, the things that He has for you. Do you want everything that the Lord's got for you? Or just part of it? Are you satisfied with some of His blessings? Are you satisfied with knowing Him fairly well? Are you satisfied with where your walk, with your relationship is at with the Lord now? You know, we get to those places sometimes in relationships and everything. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm good here. I'm comfortable. This is all right. And we get complacent in those things. And then we start to taking things for granted. You know? You get that way with husbands and wives and everything. When that relationship's new and everything, man, it's, it's fun. It's a lot of exciting. But then, you know, you... you you have to deal with life. And life is just day-to-day, -day mundane stuff. And sometimes that affects that relationship and, and, and the newness wears off. And you get complacent. And you forget about it. And you say, well, you know, here we are. And this is it. And it's alright. It's good. But you just kind of stay put. And that's hard. Paul says, you know what? I'm not there yet. I'm not perfect. I'm not complete in my walk and my relationship with the Lord. I don't have it all figured out. I don't understand everything. And even Ed doesn't know everything. Ed showed over here. Last time he said he raised his hands. <laughs> we all want to continue to grow in our relationship with the Lord and have it become more intimate, deeper. I press on, so I keep going. I keep pressing on. I keep moving forward. You know why we call those that, 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 that walk away from the Lord backsliders? Because they, they stopped at some point and stood still. Went, yep, alright, got my salvation. I know Jesus and everything. This is really cool. I'm going to hang right here. They stop pressing on. Something happens in their life. Something shows up there and it's hard. It's difficult. And you stop pressing on. Well, I guess the Lord just wants me to stop right here. But there's no staying put. You start sliding back into that old ways and everything. Paul says, I'm going to press on to lay hold of those things that Christ has already hold of me. Those things that He has for me. We press on. We keep moving. We keep going. There's more to come. 
We have to keep our eyes on Jesus and follow Him. We have to have that desire in our heart to grow, continue to grow. I look around and there's several of you here that have been believers longer than I've been alive. And that's getting to be kind of a long time. But as I, I know you and I see you and I, I, I see that desire to continue to grow in the Lord. And that encourages us. He wants to lay hold of it. Verse 13, he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended it. I'm not there. I don't have it all together. You don't get to that point where finally you get your, your whatever degree it is in Christianity and everything. Well, all right, I got it all. And I'll just go on with this. You don't finish. He said, I haven't got it all done. I'm not done yet. He says, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Well, you know, leave it to the Lord to give us good advice in His Word. Forget about those things that are behind. How many of you hang on to the stuff that's behind you? How many of you keep looking back? It's hard to keep going forward when you're looking backwards. Try that sometime. Just walk across the room. Looking that way, going that way. See how far you get. It gets difficult, doesn't it? You start running into things, bouncing off of stuff, falling down. And it don't, doesn't take very far. And it may be even in your own house. Some place that you're used to, that you're accustomed to. We keep looking back. Paul says, I'm not looking back. He says, I'm not looking back to those things of the, the flesh before I was saved and those things that meant so much that were so important or at least seem to be in this life that were important to people around me that made Him somebody in this world. So I'm not looking back to those. I don't look back to them things, to those things. I look forward. I press on. I keep moving forward. We think, well, yeah, you know what? You look back at my life before I knew Christ. There ain't a whole lot worth looking back at back there. You know, just as soon not. Let alone hang on to that stuff. But then we do this also as Christians, as believers. We look back to the things that the Lord has done in our life. That's okay. That encourages us. But we don't want to stay there, do we? Remember Jesus and, and, and Peter and him up on the Mount of Transfiguration? They saw that. They saw the Lord there glorified and all that. What did Peter do? Hey man, this is it. How could it get better than this? This is great. We've seen the Lord glorified right here. This is it. This is the place. It's wonderful. Let's build some monuments and everything and stay right here. Because this is the greatest, coolest thing that we've ever seen from the Lord. And we just want to stay put right there, don't you? Or it says, oh, come on, Pete. There's better things coming, man. You ain't seen nothing yet. And we as believers who have been walking with the Lord and serving the Lord and have seen the Lord work not just in our lives, but through our lives. God, it's great when the Lord uses you to affect somebody else's life, isn't it? whether it's encouraging, exhorting, lifting up a brother or sister, leading someone who doesn't, didn't know the Lord to the Lord. Boy, that's great. That's, that, that's cool. We've seen the Lord do things and work in our lives. And we remember those, and it's a great testimony, and it's an encouragement. But if we only look back to those things that the Lord has done, We're going to lose sight of what the Lord's doing. There's more to come. Paul says, I keep pressing on. Paul could at this time in his life say, you know, <laughs> it's been a great trip with the Lord and everything like that. He's done some awesome, miraculous things and everything. This is great. I'm just going to stop right here and reminisce about the great things that the Lord's done through my life and in my life. And it would have been full. Paul says, you know what? I'm not looking back at those things. I'm not getting hung up on those. I'm not staying there. I'm not building the monuments. I'm not staying there on that mount, mountaintop. 
I'm going to go down and go through the next valley and see what's over there on the next one. It's kind of like being an explorer, isn't it? You just keep going. Because the Lord keeps leading us. Think about Pastor Don when he retired. Oh, I'm retired now. I guess I'll just go sit in a rocking chair someplace. Right? (laughs) No. It's just moving on, pressing forward, seeing what the Lord's got next for you. Looking forward to that time where we get to be absent from the body and present with Him. And guess what? There's going to be a whole bunch of new stuff to go see and learn and do. That's not the end either. We move on. We keep pressing forward. It's like that little seed that died in the ground and that little plant pops up there. There you go. Something new. We keep moving forward. We keep pressing on. Forget those things that are behind us. And keep moving forward. Keep following the Lord. Keep pressing on. If you stay still, you get stagnant. Look at 2 Timothy, and we'll finish up with this one here. (coughs) 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved His appearing. Paul says, I'm already being poured out, but He's not empty yet. We talked about that. We let the Lord pour into us and then pour out of us. So, He runs through us. Paul says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. Boy, He can see the finish line. It is right there. He says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. And the crown is laid up there for me. I fought the fight. I finished the race. Any fight fans out here? Yeah? A few. You ever watch those fights and everything and it just seems like one of the the persons, one of the opponents just kind of quits before the bell rings? You know, what happens to them? They get knocked out, don't they? They lose. They get beat up. You keep fighting until the bell rings, the final bell. Ding! Paul says, man, I'm right there. The, the, the last round's up. Those runners that run, they keep running. How many of times have you ever been watching a, a race in the Olympics or something like that and somebody gets out in front there and they open up a big gap in, in there and everything like that, and they get pretty close to the finish line. Go, ah, I did good. And just sort of stroll on across the, the finish line. It don't take long for the rest of the pack to catch up. They run all the way through to the end. I can remember, I hate to run, but I can remember when I was in, in, the, in the service in the military and everything, we used to have to run. Yeah, I don't know why they made us run a lot, and we would do these things and we would do these runs, and it didn't matter was it whether it was three miles or or five or six or seven miles, whatever it was. We're out there running, and these crazy people they'd get there and they'd be almost to the end of the run, and pick it up, and just pour it on. Yeah, oh, this is the dumbest thing ever. You know, for somebody that doesn't like to run and do all that stuff, and everything, it, it kind of is. But when we take that and we look at that and we put this into this Christian life that we're living, 
We don't get to that point where we, we fought a good fight for 11 out of 12 rounds. I got enough points scored up here. I'm going to beat this guy even if he does knock me out. I think I'll just go stand out there. We don't run this race in such a way that we get to a point where it's like, you know what, i got a pretty good lead on these guys and everything like that. I already set a personal record for myself. I can just walk the rest of the way. Because they pass you by. Paul says, press on, run the race, fight the fight, till the end. Till you cross the finish line. Till you hear the last ding in the last round. And you want that bell to ring while you're throwing that last punch, man. You want to cross that finish line in full stride, just going as hard as you can. But you can't do any of that looking back. You can't do any of that without knowing the Lord and putting that relationship, that fellowship with Jesus first, without recognizing the importance of it. These things in the world that can, that can, can cloud us out, that can snare us up, that can trip us up, that can be stumbling blocks, they don't mean anything. They're scubalon. Leave them behind and follow Jesus. Be motivated by the power of the resurrection, the life that we have in Christ, and run the race to the very end. Because as soon as you cross that line, there you are in the presence of Jesus. There you are resurrected in that immortal incorruption. There you are with that crown, that prize that He died on the cross to purchase for you. Keep pressing on. No matter what comes, persecution, suffering, even death. Because the things of the Lord are far more valuable than anything in 